Uh, do you want to ask me some leading questions since you're interviewing me right now? No. No? Okay. Uh, Tell us and the viewers to the camera Okay. Well, all of your new treasures. Well, these are my pickups for the last, uh, we're going to say two weeks, because that sounds better than the last week. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, well, I bought, what's accurate? About a week-ish and a half, we'll okay. say, ish. Uh, I bought a lot of these in anticipation for Halloween. Not all of them. Uh, some, some are actually like, uh, you know, me switching over to Blu-ray from the previous DVD that I had, or like, uh, well, one is anyway. Um, so we'll start with the comics before we go into the movies. Why not? Um, so I, I lost my copies of both of these a long, long time ago. Uh, so I figured I'd buy some copies for them. You know, again, to have them, just to have them in the library. You got The Crow, of course. You know, because I, I, I used to be a snotty little goth, too, uh, a long time ago. And this was one of my favorite graphic novels. I mean, you know, James Sabari is a Dallas native. He's fantastic. You know, his art is beautiful. Uh, it's a bit rough toward the beginning. I mean, he did start this when he was in the army having a panic attack, a meltdown over his girlfriend being murdered. Uh, so you can, it's understandable. But it gets it gets so painterly as it goes on, and he's just working with black and white pen and ink, and it's it's just it's just the best. Um, and this is the is is the uh, director's cut. We'll say that they put out a couple of years ago, so it's got about you know, like twenty more pages, and a few more uh, notes toward the end and stuff. And what I really like is there's a note at the end where he talks about his favorite albums that he used for inspiration when he was uh, when he was writing it, and. Uh, a lot of my favorite albums too, like Big Black, Songs About Fucking, one of my favorite albums in the entire world, and Atomizer. Um, so there's that, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I've owned like four or five copies of Watchmen in my life, uh, and I've lost every single one of them because I've either like loaned them out because it's Watchmen, people love Watchmen, uh, or I've just moved and they've just been packed away in boxes. So I finally bought a hardcover of it because it was cheap. It was like 15 bucks. So I was like, all right, a deluxe edition. Uh, this was the first edition, I think, that, like, uh, DC put out. I could be wrong, and I'm probably wrong, uh, I'm sure. But uh, I think it's, like, the first edition that DC put out where it was just Dave Gibbons working on it, the artist, not Alan Moore. It was after he had kind of, you know, decided to not work on DC's editions of his stuff anymore because of the terrible movies they'd made out of his stuff. So, uh... This is a pretty basic edition. I mean, the colors are re reproduced pretty faithfully to what they were in, in the in the original uh, mass market paperback and also the issues themselves. And then also, uh, this is new, uh, these compositional sketches and things like that. A lot of it, if you have the Art of Watchmen book that he, uh, or Watching the Watchmen, I think it's called, uh, which I have over there as well, uh, is gonna be familiar to you. But uh, this is a really beautiful edition to have on your shelf. If you, if you don't wanna spend the hundred plus dollars for the absolute edition that of course DC pumped out. So yeah, there's that. Um, let's go ahead and get into the, to, into the DVD outs or the, the blue routes. Yeah, All right. So we're going to start from the top. <laughs> we're going to start from the top. All right. Um, so my first couple of buys uh, were both Kurosawa films. One is actually a rebuy because I wanted to finally get it on Blu-ray rather than DVD. Uh, there's not much that's different about it except for the restored picture, which is a dramatic difference. So it's that's worth it on its own. This is, uh, and I hope I'm saying this right. If I'm not, I apologize. Uh, but this is Ikiru uh, by Kurosawa, or To Live, I guess. We'll say it in English, it's easier. Uh, it's a really great film about kind of like an old bureaucrat who realizes that he's wasted his entire life and then he finds out that he has cancer uh, and he just goes on a mad dash to try to figure out what he can do to give some kind of meaning to his life before he dies. And so it's, it's a terrific, heartbreaking, beautiful, amazing, life-affirming film. And I mean that in the most genuine way. I mean, it's Kurosawa. He's one of, he's, he's one of the masters of cinema, bar none. So, yes, see that. Oh, anyway, uh, you have uh, another Kurosawa film. This one's earlier. This was, I think, one of his first big successes, Stray Dog. It's the first film that he did with Toshiro Mifune. Uh, also with uh, Shimura uh, as a detective. I haven't seen this. As a, as a detective duo, he 
He's a younger detective who loses his gun in the city and it's kind of an examination of post-war Japan and stuff like that. It's really atmospheric, so I'm told, and I can't wait to see it. So there's that. Um, from Shout Factory, I don't have a 4K player, so this is gonna sound kind of ridiculous and I do apologize, but it also includes also a fully stocked Blu-ray as well, and it's, it's about the same price as a Blu-ray, so it has both, and it also has a DVD as well. Or, I, no, well, it doesn't have a DVD, but um, their restored version of the classic Deer Hunter. This is not a Halloween movie. Uh, it's pretty horrifying, but, you know, it's not. Uh, this is restored in their typically fantastic package for their Shout Select line, which... Uh, approaches Criterion territory, but uh, is also uh, unpretentious in the Shout Factory way. So, you know, this is, uh, you know, you have audio commentaries, interviews, deleted and extended scenes, and uh, an interview with film critic David Thompson, who's great, and who I have a ton of books by up there on the shelf. Uh, so yeah, a lot of fun. I can't wait to see it again after seeing it when I was a kid. Lifeboat here, from this is from Kino Lorber, one of Hitchcock's undersung films. Anybody who hasn't seen this needs to see it. It's a study in how to write a screenplay. Uh, I would call it a chamber piece set in one location. It's set uh, on uh, on a raft after, uh, you know, like during World War II, uh, a bunch of people survive on a raft after their boat's blown up by, you know, Germans. And um, it's about them trying to survive, but also they discover that one of them might be a Nazi. Suspense drama it's really really good and if you have to ask and I'm, I'm probably asking questions that for the people who watch my channel if you do watch my channel you've probably seen this film or you've probably studied this film like I have so but if you haven't you have to ask did Hitchcock find a way to have a cameo in a film that's set in one location a raft in the middle of the ocean like he did in the rest of his films you bet he did but where is it you're gonna see it's pretty clever uh this was cool. I picked this up on a, on a recommendation from a friend. Uh, this is an Abel Ferreira film, whose films I love uh, because they're so ugly and they're so dirty and they're so weird and they're so unique and they're typically either, they either have a really, really big budget or a supremely low budget, which is weird because he's been doing movies for like 50 years. Um, this was recommended by my friend uh, Hannah of Austin, Texas. Uh, who says is one of her favorite films, so I can't wait to check it out. And I bought this for Halloween. This is The Addiction. Uh, it's, a, it's kind of a New York vampire story, and this is actually kind of in the mode of The Driller Killer, one of his first films. So it's low budget, it's black and white. The Driller Killer wasn't black and white, but it's low budget, it's gritty, it's grimy, it's about like a college student who gets turned into a vampire and all the stuff that kind of develops out from that. Now, I haven't seen this yet but it's one of the only Abel Ferreira films that I haven't seen so I can't wait to see it and I hope you were right Hannah because if you weren't I'm coming for you anyway um oh switching up uh Candyman the <laughs> what's surprisingly <laughs> okay so I saw this when I was a kid right and I guess when it came out uh there was some buzz about it because it was it was a big thing for like African American representation in cinema in in horror cinema because here was this masculine representation of a horror figure uh, like a Freddy Krueger or a Jason or whatever but he was more suave he was like he was like a vampire but he wasn't ridiculous like Blackula and here was Candyman and it's, and it's it's a great film but what I do think is surprising is that when you watch this film I'm gonna be honest with you this was um, it's 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 based on a Clive Barker story, so it has, it. The impetus I think is much more on the unknowable kind of Lovecraftian sort of uh, existential horror that Clive Barker always talks about, rather than any kind of like, you know, there. There is the exploration of racism and stuff in America's history and stuff, but it's it's a it's much more subdued to the uh, other things that are going on. And also, it feels kind of like a Wes Craven movie, so it's a lot funnier than I think people realize because people are starting to hold this up now as like an important racial statement. And it is, 
but it doesn't take itself as seriously as you guys think. So have fun with it and enjoy it. And I'm going to, you know. Um, the Strangers I bought uh, specifically because I didn't like it when I saw it the first time. And I want to try it out again because everybody's talking about it like it's a masterpiece now. And I can't wait to see it again because there's something that's so ambiguous and so primal about the concept. And I can't wait to, this is a great Halloween film that I can't wait for us to check out. Uh, this is gonna be really cool. I know that you behind the camera aren't really big on concepts like this, like home invasion stories, but uh, this one is really good. I wasn't the biggest fan of it when I saw it, but you know, I'm older now, so let's, let's, let's see if I've changed my opinion a little bit. Um, this one, I'm super excited about. Okay, and we're gonna wrap this video up pretty soon because uh, your eyelids are starting to droop. Okay, but um, this is a double feature, also from Scream Factory, only on DVD, of two uh, kind of B films, action films, right? Uh, two that are really great. One, if y'all are fans of Quentin Tarantino, Death Proof, whatever, is referenced directly, Dirty Mary, Crazy Larry. Uh, it contains one of the best car chases in the history of cinema ever. It's amazing. Uh, I saw it a bunch when I was a kid. Can't wait to see it again. Glad to finally have it in the collection because I'm writing something specifically about a car chase, so I'm doing my car chase homework right now. And also, too, we have Race to the Devil, which is really interesting. I have not seen that one, but it's really interesting because it's like Dirty Mary, Crazy Larry, except crossed with satanic cultists and two married couples just out on vacation drinking beer who get caught up in the and this whole thing with satanic cultists and they're chasing them around. It's, 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 it's pretty interesting. <laughs> so I've heard. Um, oh, and they both star Peter Fonda. That's, that's the linkage right there. Um, so there's that. There, there's our pickups. Stack one. Let's get to stack two. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh, also, before, before we go, real quick, I do want to say on this... This is actually a fantastic film. Don't take anything I said the wrong way. I just think it's funny how seriously people are taking this film now. Um, when it was a B-movie when it came out, and it's proud to be a B-movie. Let it be a B-movie. It's okay to be a B-movie. That's it. Okay, have a good night.